In 1995, Japan was introduced to Parasite Eve, a sci-fi horror novel written by Hideaki Sena. The story focuses on a research assistant named Toshiaki Nagashima, who after losing his wife in a car crash, begins looking for a way to bring her back to life. Unbeknownst to him, the cells within her, mainly her mitochondria, are evolving into a sentient being named Eve who is hell-bent on trying to take over the world. And if you said to yourself, what in the hell did he just say? Trust me, I had a similar reaction when I first read the book. To say that this novel had a really weird ass premise would be an understatement, yet at the same time it was actually extremely unique to me. While I don't often read sci-fi horror novels or really novels in general, the premise of cells in our body revolting was something that was actually really unique to me, or at least being sentient that was all unique and stuff. And I guess you could say that it was the same deal for Japanese readers as they ended up loving it so much that the novel would end up getting a film adaptation in 1997. It followed the story of the novel with some slight deviations here and there. And a little fun fact for y'all, did y'all know that Joe Hisashi, the dude who's known for his amazing music on the Studio Ghibli films? Well, he ended up actually doing the music for the Parasite Eve film. This doesn't really have anything to do with that specifically, it was just a really weird discovery I found during my research. Now, if you're curious at all about this movie, I do recommend checking it out if you ever get the chance. While in hindsight it isn't that scary and it plays more like a drama than anything, there are a lot of moments that range from damn to the fuck? And the success of this novel didn't end with just a movie adaptation, as on September 10th, 1998, US audiences would be introduced to the game Parasite Eve. <laughs> The worst foe lies within. Parasite Eve. This was developed by Squaresoft, or Square Enix as we know them by today, and it has you playing as Aya Brea, an NYPD officer who is trying to stop a sentient mitochondria named Eve from destroying humanity. Weird, I know. Around the time that this game came out, Square was writing off the success of Final Fantasy VII, which allowed them to experiment and become more ambitious with the games that they were making. This eventually led to the creation of a bunch of classic Square games like Brave Fist or Mushashi, Xenogears, Vagrant Story, and of course the topic of today's video, Parasite Eve. As for the inception of this game, I wasn't able to find the exact reason for how this game came about. Though I can only speculate that either the publishers of the book or Square themselves hit each other up for a game adaptation. Though what's fucked up about all of this was that the author of the book didn't even know it was being made until after development had wrapped up. Which is fucked up! But I digress. And for this game, it ended up getting a development staff that had some of the best people in Square, such as the legendary Hironobu Sakaguchi, who would act as the producer for this game, Takashi Tokita of Live Alive and Chrono Trigger fame, who would act as not just the director, but would also be responsible for the story, Tetsuya Nomura, who acted as the character designer, and finally there's Yoko Shinomura, who would compose this game's amazing ass music. And something interesting about this game, beyond this fusion of survival horror and RPG elements was that some parts of it were originally from Final Fantasy VII. During that game's development, the original premise was going to have players play as a New York detective investigating some sort of mystery within the city. Of course, that would be overturned for the more, uh, environmentalist story, I guess, yeah? Yeah, that premise would be reused for Parasite Eve, just with some... Horror-like elements, I guess? Eh, well, in general, the game is far from scary. Beyond that, there isn't really much I was able to find about this game beyond the fact that it uses a modified engine that was used for Final Fantasy VII. Though, I am curious about why it ended up going for the survival horror route. So, like, if y'all have an inkling of a clue, put it down in the comments below, because I will be really interested to know more. As for the reception of this game, critics and fans were eating it up like it was a cake made from heaven. Many of the praise went to its gameplay, graphics, and music. Plus, it was praised for how well it adapted the novel, which... I, from how I read it, I can only guess that there weren't any good games based on novels? Yeah, I, I wasn't sure about that one. And since this game's release, it ended up getting two sequels, one being considered good and the other being, uh, uh, let's just call it a black sheep for now. 
Yet despite not having a new game in over 14 years, there's still a good amount of people who still bring up this game. And something you'll hear often in the online space, no matter where you are, is the demand for this game to be remade. If you mention Parasite Eve in any way, shape, or form, you're gonna be met with a bunch of people who want this game to either be remade, ported to modern consoles, or get a whole new game entirely. And yeah, I'm one of those people. It's one of the few games that I ended up playing like more than four times. And something that you're going to know this year especially is that if I played a game more than four times, right, or a series of games more than four times, that is indicative. Yes, I'm busting out the big words here. It's indicative to how much I either love that game or I love that series. In the case for Parasite Eve, I love this game a lot. And if you couldn't tell by the length of this video, I'm gonna be yapping my ass off because there is so much I want to talk about with this damn video. Now, like always, I will be supplying a timestamp down below for those who don't wanna get the story spoiled for them just in case they wanna experience it for themselves. Though before we actually dive into it, there is something I wanna talk about real quick. Now, this game is a loose sequel to the novel of the same name, so you don't have to read or watch the original to know what's going on. Though, if you do decide to read the novel or watch the film, uh, certain events are gonna seem very familiar. The year is 1997 and we have ourselves a tour of a festive New York City on Christmas Eve. Here we're introduced to Aya Brea, an NYPD officer on a nice little date to the opera. However, shit quickly goes sideways when during the performance, one of the actors bursts into flames leading to a chain reaction of people spontaneously combusting. In the midst of the chaos, the only people we see unaffected is the actress on stage, Melissa, and Aya who is in the audience. The latter goes to confront Melissa on stage and is suddenly stopped when her body begins to burn up. Melissa ends up telling her that her cells have awakened before flying away to the backstage. And no matter how many times I play this game, this animation will always look funny to me. She looks like she's getting pulled away while saying, Wee! Aya gives chase and we manage to corner Melissa, who is actually a being known as Eve. You see, Eve here is a sentient mitochondria that was apparently dormant inside Melissa. As for how she took control, uh. That isn't fully explained yet. Regardless, Eve tells Aya that her mitochondria needs more time to develop and escapes into the sewer, whereas Aya is chasing her, she has to deal with the animals who have been turned into eldritch beings by Eve. Aya corners her for one last time, yet she escapes again and sticks a mutated crocodile at us. After defeating it, Aya heads outside of Carnegie Hall where she is picked up by her partner Daniel Dolis. And afterwards, we get a narration about how, over the next few days, shit begins to go down. Not just figuratively, I mean literally. On Christmas Day, the police are scrambling around trying to investigate how everybody in the opera last night just spontaneously combusts. During the speculation, the captain of police, Douglas Baker, attempts to spin the incident around to avoid the public from freaking out. However, this is up falling flat when Aya tells the reporters the truth, pissing Baker off. Aya and Daniel later head to the American Museum of Natural History to learn more about the mitochondria from a researcher named Hans Clamp. While during the, uh... Long ass explanation, Aya mentions the clamp about Eve, which leads to him rushing the two out of his lab. The two head back to the police station where we learn that Melissa, aka Eve, is at Central Park. However, Daniel realizes his son and ex-wife are there, causing him to panic. They rush to the park yet it's stopped due to almost being burned, causing Aya, who is somehow immune, to go find Melissa on her own. And as he reaches the stadium, she... Oh. Oh. Oh no. No. Oh god. Oh god! Aya chases Eve to a horse carriage where the two end up duking it out. However, it quickly ends when Eve ends up knocking Aya out. We later cut to Daniel being reunited with his son Ben, though his wife wasn't so lucky. They head back to the police station where Daniel begins to look for Aya. However, Baker tells him that everyone in the city is being evacuated. In the chaos, we meet Kinohiko Maeda, a Japanese scientist who came to New York after hearing about what happened at Carnegie Hall. After a set of flashbacks, we end up seeing Aya and Maeda in an abandoned apartment with Daniel Lair showing up. While Aya is trying to get her bearings straight, we learn from Maeda that the event so far is similar to an event that happened in Japan a couple years ago. During the recap of these events, Aya tries to come to terms with her new power and ends up getting understandably shaken when she realizes that in some ways she's similar to Eve and is scared of herself for what she could be capable of. You know what? Considering the fact that all of this happens in the span of two days, I too would be scared if I had the same abilities as a rampaging mitochondria turning people into fucking orange juice. 
But I digress. On the third day of this shit fest, the group heads to the museum so they can look more into what's going on. During Maeda's observation, he discovers that only Aya has the ability to fight off against Eve due to her mitochondria resisting Eve's influence. Why? We'll cover that later. Clint later shows up where he begins to interrogate the group about why they're in his lab and later about Aya. It ends up being cut short when Daniel finds his son and wife's name on a list. He attempts to get some answers out of Clint but is swiftly kicked out. They later head to the police station where they find it completely ransacked and they soon learn from Aya that Eve was here. Daniel panics and begins to look for his son who is somewhere in the police station with Aya later giving chase. While this is happening, we see Ben chasing after one of the police dogs, Sheva, and later we see Baker finding and attempting to protect Ben from the now mutated dog. After fighting through Eve's uh, eldritch monsters, I have fights and later defeats the mutated dog, and while they manage to save Baker and Ben, it ended up coming at the cost of the lives of several officers. And just before this quote unquote day ends, I have promises Ben to take down Eve. As the group is trying to figure out what to do next, Maeda comes to the realization that Eve might be trying to recreate the ultimate being, and after learning from Daniel about a hospital that specializes in artificial insemination, Aya and Maeda rushes over there to try to stop her. During this, Aya comes across a mysterious little girl that looks eerily similar to her little sister, Maya. And sorry to break things up real quick, but make sure to keep her in the back of your mind real quick because trust me, She's gonna be important for later. Aya chases the little girl and is then trapped in the basement by Eve. She manages to escape and rushes to where the sperm is only to find out that it's already been taken. Though while investigating the room, Aya ends up finding a set of files containing the names of her mother, Mariko Bria, and her sister, Maya. And I know y'all got questions, but trust me, We'll address it in a bit. Aya heads to the roof where after finding a giant ass spider, she ends up encountering Eve who goes on a tangent about succeeding where her sister failed. W wait a minute, could that mean that her sister is- <gasps> Close your mouth. At the same time this is going on, we find out that the Navy has pulled up to New York City to try to stop Eve. However, this ends up failing when she takes control of the fighter jet pilots and turns them into orange juice. Aya escapes from the hospital just as the jet is about to fly into it and is soon reunited with Daniel and Maeda. While heading back to the police station, we learn that Clamp is responsible for the events in some way, shape, or form, leading to the group splitting up to try to find him and Eve. And I hope you're ready for the fifth day because they're about to make the other four days seem relatively peaceful. On day five, the group begins searching across the city for Eve and Clam, and later find a clue that they might be somewhere in the sewers. Aya goes to investigate and discovers an orange blob going through the sewers. And yes, that blob of orange juice is the amalgamation of the people from Central Park, the uh, little jet pilots from the day before, and I guess the other groups of people that she ended up killing off screen. Jesus Christ. Aya chases it to the Brooklyn Bridge and later finds it going to the museum. She heads over there only to be met with revived and mutated dinosaurs slash other extinct animals. Yes, those were the words I just said. And at this point, all I can really ask is how the fuck can Eve do this? Is this the same shit that the niggas at Jurassic Park was doing? Like, I need answers that need answering ASAP. During her trek through the museum, Aya ends up in Clamp's lab where she meets up with Maeda. During their conversation, they learn that Clamp had created artificial sperm for Eve with the purpose of giving birth to the ultimate being, who for now, we're just gonna call the UB, you know, make it means quick and easy, so yeah. Clamp ends up showing up after the explanation and attempts to attack Aya before Daniel shows up and gives him a long overdue ass whooping. They end up trying to interrogate Clamp where we end up getting our good old info dump. This Eve we've been going up against is sort of like the sister of the original Eve from the novel. You see, in the novel, that Eve, who we'll call the first Eve, was able to create the UB, but it shortly died after Nagashima's mitochondria were able to override the UB's mitochondria. Fast forward and we find this Eve, who we'll call the second Eve, calling upon Clamp to artificially engineer some sperm so that there will be no way of the mitochondria being overridden. Now, how the hell does something like this even happen? Magic science shit. I don't know, man. This is, oh, this is, this is so fucking weird. After his explanation, Clamp ends up combusting into flames thanks to Eve, and after going to the museum some more and fighting a fucking T-Rex, yes, you heard me right, a Tyrannosaurus Rex, Aya confronts Eve, who is now pregnant with the UB, but she ends up cutting her conversation short when she summons that orange mass of orange juice to protect her while she conceives it. Meanwhile, Aya, Maeda, and Daniel meet up, and while driving away from the museum, we get yet another info dump. I promise this is the last one. Maybe. 
Prior to the events of the story, Aya was involved in a serious car accident that killed her mother, Mariko Bria, and her younger sister, Maya. Now, around the same time they were admitted into the hospital, Melissa Pierce, the woman who would later be overtaken by the second Eve, would also be hospitalized due to kidney failure and would later get her kidney from Maya. Now, the thing about that, though, was that the first Eve was still in Maya's body. Huh? Maya then explains one of the events from the novel where the original Eve targeted a girl who was undergoing a kidney transplant to have a uterus to translate the egg in, that egg being the UB, and the girl being Aya's mother. Now, I'm sure there's some shit behind that and something that I'm probably missing. Well, Christ, I don't even know anymore. And as for how Eve took over Melissa, it would be because of the immunosuppressants she was taking for her liver. Jesus Christ. And I want to remind you that we're not even done with this day yet, as we still gotta battle Eve. After the Navy's failed attack, they pick up Aya and the others to discuss a new plan of action. This plan would involve having Aya attack Eve from a helicopter, as she's the only one that can really do anything. Aya agrees to the plan with it eventually working. However, this isn't enough as she decides to end it once and for all, and parachutes down to the Statue of Liberty to confront Eve. The two end up duking it out, with Aya finally defeating Eve and her body dissolving away into the orange gloop. Everything is finally over. Eve's dead, and as the group is finally settling down, we... Are you fucking- Yep, the UB is somehow born, leading to the Navy evacuating everyone on board the ship, except for Aya, who is standing on business to kill this fucking thing. However, she ends up biting more than she can chew, as with each defeat, the UB keeps evolving and becoming stronger. That is, until Daniel jumps out of the helicopter to give Aya some bullets created by Maeda. With the gun Aya got from him in the museum, she's finally able to kill the UB. Kinda. This defeat leads into the most annoying chase sequence where Aya decides to turn the pressure in the engine room extremely high in hopes of the ship blowing up and taking the UB with it. And well... As the group meets back up at the docks and is reflecting about the past few days, we end up getting yet another info dump and hopefully, hopefully, this is the last one. We learn from Maeda that the reason why Aya's mitochondria were able to fight against Eve was because Aya ended up getting her right eye from Maya. Though unlike Melissa, who would eventually be taken over by Eve, Aya's body would undergo an evolutionary change that resulted in her mitochondria being able to live together with Eve's mitochondria? I think I, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you when this part happened I I, 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 don't, I don't really know how to say it more specifically than that just uh the game ends with Aya and the others going to the opera while some funny moments ensue Aya's mitochondria ends up communicating with everyone else turning their eye color red and everything going dark besides the audience's eyes huh okay that is a weird way to you know end the game and all you know I wonder if ah shit Mm-hmm. Okay. It's better we talk about this now rather than later. After being in the game once, you unlock a new mode known as EX mode. Now, I'll save all the details about it for later, but just know that this mode right here holds the sort of true ending of this game. I also heard that this was technically an alternate ending, but honestly, with the way that things play out, uh, this one should have been the true ending of the game. And while this one is also, you know, somewhat quick, it holds the uh, last bit of info dump, which is uh, something to say the least. After the events in Carnegie Hall, we see Aya going through the Chrysler building, where at the top floor, she comes across a cocoon that has her sister Maya in it. Though, uh, here's the thing. The Maya that we're currently seeing is actually the first Eve. You know, the one from the novel. So, what happened was that after giving the kidney to Melissa and the cornea to Aya, Clamp had cultivated the cells from the first Eve in order to study it, and somehow, some way, the first Eve took Maya's body and made a nest in the Chrysler building as a sort of backup plan, just in case the second Eve failed in giving birth to the UB, or just in general, her plans failed. Aya ends up fighting against the first Eve in a long and very difficult battle, yet despite Aya managing to come out on top, it ends up being quickly overshadowed when Eve begins to take 
control of her. This is due to the fact that Aya's mitochondria had evolved even further than Maya's, causing Eve to take the chance to becoming the most powerful mitochondria. Just as Eve is about to succeed, Maya shows up and begins to fight her off, eventually leading to Eve's influence being sort of destroyed and Aya ends up losing her powers. And after having a little heartfelt reunion, the two end up leaving with Eve having been finally defeated. Jesus, that was a lot. Parasite Eve's story is a lot weirder than I remember it being, and there's a lot of things that I enjoyed about this story which I'll definitely get into soon, but something that I really want to talk about was how well that Zakita was able to handle this story. So a year prior, I had read the Parasite Eve novel for the first time, which was interesting to say the least, and when I went through my fifth playthrough was this what I'm currently, you know, did, and yes, I know, I've played this game way too many times, I ended up noticing a lot of similarities. Clamp cultivating cells to study and later being called upon Eve to do her bidding is literally a plot of the novel, like literally one of the main plots of it. The plot to create the ultimate being, literally from the novel, and of course the process of how Eve took over the body of Melissa, literally a plot point that happened during the uh, novel. Now, I know I'm probably forgetting a couple of bits and story bits from the novel and shit, but um, overall, having known what happens in this story and what happens in the novel and kind of comparing the two together, it kind of made the playthrough really interesting. Certain events, which were very similar in the novel, was a lot more impactful here, and I ended up damn near making a game out of pointing out the references that the story makes. Plus, the story bits of the EX mode is essentially a continuation with the first Eve coming back for what essentially is payback. In general, I gotta praise Tsukita for how well he was able to translate the events from the novel into the game and kind of morph it in a way so that people who have never read the novel would actually be able to understand what's going on. There's another part of me which would have been interested to see this more as a direct sequel, but considering that we didn't even get this novel until 2007, literally 12 years after the release of the original novel, yeah, that's understandable. Other than that, this story does do some pretty good stuff. The mystery in this story involving Aya's past and how the second Eve came about kept me really interested to see how things would go, though easily the highlight for the story was his characters. The characters here are great, especially the main trio who complement each other so well as a small team of people trying to save the world. Though I can't help but feel like Aya and Daniel's character had elements of Cloud and Barrett respectfully. Mainly Aya, who after having played a bit of Final Fantasy VII earlier in the year, I, I couldn't really shake that comparison off. Both are badass dramatic characters who have been through a lot, yet as the story continues, they kind of have this resolve to see things through that kind of makes them endearing, if that makes sense. I also like the fact that Aya in general is a badass and is also capable of showing human emotions. The big thing about her being that she's afraid that she'll be just like Eve, which understandably affects her throughout the entire game, and I like how they handled that. There's also the EX mode, which closes out her story pretty well. Of course, there's like two more games, but it's, it was the only good thing about that mode. Next is Bear, oh wait, I mean Daniel, who is a great partner that cares about his family a lot, so much so that he is willing to whoop somebody's ass for them, and if you couldn't tell already, he's just Barrett, but a bit more tamed. There's also Maeda, which honestly, I don't really have a lot to say about him besides his introduction being pretty funny because the racist ends up getting a fiery case of karma. Finally, I want to mention the main antagonist, Eve, who is one of my favorite villains in gaming. While her motive is just nothing but pure genocide and shit, what makes her shine is almost how charismatic she is. She steals the spotlight in every scene she's in and has this aura about her that demands your attention. It also helps that she's constantly active throughout the story, with each day featuring Eve winning in some way. And those moments feel a lot more horrifying rather than cheap, which I'm glad that didn't happen. Though despite my praise for the story, I do have a couple problems with it. My first issue is with the lack of voice acting, sure. During the mid to late 90s, voice acting was sort of in their infancy, and maybe there's a reason why Square didn't add it in, but I think the cutscenes would have benefited with some form of voice acting, because otherwise, these bitches are boring. It could have done something as simple as just, you know, voicing their emotions for certain situations so that they could give those scenes some more, uh, <clears throat> oomph to it, if that makes sense. My other issue is with the story bits of the EX mode. Now, while what we get is pretty good, there should have been more story to this mode, especially for what you gotta go through. Other than that, I love the story of Parasite Eve. It isn't completely perfect, but the moments that are in here are pretty memorable. The chaos in Carnegie Hall, the Central Park scene that... 
unfortunately gave me flashbacks to the end of Evangelion, and more were just moi. And I forgot to mention this, but the FMVs for this game are really nice. Now, some of them might have aged like, you know, most CGI projects, especially in the 90s and shit, but Beyond that, it does a really great job of how it utilizes its camera angles and the way these events are storyboarded. And it's now time to cover the other thing that makes this game love, the gameplay. The very weird, fusion-esque gameplay. The best way to describe Parasite Eve is if Resident Evil and Final Fantasy got together and had a kid. <laughs> you would think that this fusion of survival horror and RPG elements wouldn't really mix together like oil and water, but... Surprisingly, Square was actually able to make it work. Kinda. The thing to understand is that Parasite Eve goes half and half with the RPG and survival horror elements. When it comes to exploration, it plays like your typical survival horror game with all of its hallmarks, like controlling your characters via tank controls, going through pre-render environments with a fixed camera angle, and of course, limited inventory. But once you deal with the battles, where things turn into your typical RPG. Though, it isn't 100% because some of the game design aspects of survival horror is still here, like having to stay a safe distance away from enemies. It's definitely a unique system that subverts a lot of things, and it's not just for the combat, which of course we'll talk about soon, but it also applies to the random encounters. Normally when you go into an area, depending on its size, you might have to deal with like one or more encounters. However, in Parasite Eve, whenever you go into a room and encounter an enemy, that's the only one you gotta deal with, as after the encounter, no other enemy will show up in that room until you either go to the next area or leave and come back to that same room. So while you do have combat here, you still have moments to kind of just chill before doing anything, which is nice and pretty important, especially if like your health is down and shit. Though beyond that, there isn't much different with the encounter. So let's just get into the combat. When you encounter an enemy, you'll be put into a small arena where you're able to freely move around. There's a panel that has your HP as well as two meters. One is for your parasite energy, which we'll talk about in a minute, and the other is for the active time meter. And if you've played Final Fantasy 4, 5, or 6, it's going to be very familiar to you. But for those who haven't, the meter basically represents the amount of time you have before your next turn. And in Parasite Eve, it pretty much functions the same way. When the meter is filled, you can do an action like using items or changing equipment, and when choosing to attack, you'll get a dome that represents your weapon's range. The closer you are to the enemy, the higher the chance for your attack to land, as well as a higher chance for a critical hit. However, the further away an enemy is, the less likely your attacks will land and your damage begins to fall off. And something to note is that when you are attacking, you're going to be stationary until that attack is finished, and being stationary in this game, and Honestly, any survival horror game is a death sentence. You need to be moving around and trying to stay away from the enemy, because if you don't, you're going to end up just getting bitch slapped by them. This also includes dodging attacks, which in some cases is very annoying and weird to deal with, as the direction that the attack can go is very... It, it, let's just say it's weird. Alongside the 18 meter, there's the meter for your parasite energy. This acts as your magic in this game. That is, if half of the skills that Aya can acquire is the same shit a white mage would have. During the early portions of the game, you're given access to a lot of healing and support skills, though they aren't as good early on, or honestly, they're not good in general. But as you progress throughout the game, you'll get access to better skills, as well as two offensive skills, being Energy Shot and Liberate. Now, Energy Shot is somewhat decent, pretty powerful, but decent at best. But compared to Liberate, this bitch hits like a semi-truck, multiple semi-trucks. Unfortunately, the skill isn't available until around level 34, but the moment you unlock it, it's when it's gonna become your best friend. At the cost of you not being able to do anything after you use it, but granted, you don't really have to wait long for that. Now, one last thing I forgot to mention was that using Parasite Energy does have a risk factor to it. The more and more you use a skill, the slower your Parasite Energy will fill up. And for those long boss battles, this is a bitch and a half to deal with, so keep that in mind as you're playing through the game. After battles, you'll get the usual stuff like XP and items that's dropped from enemies. And of course, when you level up, your stats will increase, you know the deal. Though the highlight for leveling up is that you'll get bonus points, and while they seem worthless at first, these points can be used for three things to make the game a lot easier. You can use the points to increase the speed of your AT meter, which can not only let you get turns faster, but it can also speed up the pace of battle, which is needed for the tougher enemies. You can use the points to increase your item capacity, which is pretty self-explanatory. Now, in the short term, you won't really have to worry about running out of storage, which is great. Long term, though, it ain't worth shit. 
Finally, you can use the points to increase certain stats on your equipment, which is great alongside a certain mechanic. In Parasite Eve, you're able to modify your weapons and transfer stats slash skills from one piece of equipment to the other. This is available on day two, and the game does a pretty good job explaining how it works. Throughout the game, there's these items known as tools, which allow you to transfer an equipment skill or stats onto another. However, doing so will end up destroying that equipment that you're transferring from. And I know that sounds pretty risky, but it's a mechanic that does make this game so much easier. And that's evident from this recent playthrough I was going through, where half of the things that gave me a hard time were a lot easier to deal with. But let's say you want a less risky alternative to tools in or you want to be able to add an extra slot to your equipment. Well, to answer the first bit, there's super tools. Compared to the regular tools, these bad boys are super rare. However, getting them will allow you to transfer an equipment stats or skills to another piece of equipment without destroying it. As for the extra slots, you can go to the police department where by giving Wayne a trading card, he'll add an extra slot for your equipment. Speaking of wins, there is a series of different weapons and armor you'll obtain throughout the game that have their own pros and cons. For many of the long range fights, you have your guns, and for those close range fights, you got your clubs. And I'm not going to be around the bush here, guns are a way better option for battle than clubs. The only thing that the latter is good for is the ability to steal items from enemies when the mug skill is attached. Beyond that, you should not be using this as half the time you're going to want to fight the enemy at a safe distance. And on that subject, with the guns you can't get, I and many other people will recommend using pistols. While the other types are good, the pistol has the better speed without sacrificing your overall power. Now some will say the rifle or even the machine guns are better, which honestly, both are great options, though for the latter, you have to mod the fuck out of it for it to be decent. Then there's the armor, which has a variety of benefits. Some can help with status elements or even give you a boost in your own stats. And before we continue on, I know I didn't really talk too much about what skills you can get for your guns. Just know that skills like double slash triple command, quick draw, and critical up, is valuable, especially if you're going to go for uh, uh, that one mode that we're going to be talking about soon. That's complete fucking ass. Mm. And it goes without saying, but taking advantage of the mechanics of this game will turn a somewhat hard game to a pretty easy cakewalk. Not really, though, because this game loves to throw bullshit at you. Overall, there's five days that you're going to have to deal with. Technically, six, but we'll cover that in a little bit. And for the most part, they all play the same. The areas you go through are semi-linear, where you're able to explore it for extra goodies, something I will always recommend to do regardless of the game. You have really simple puzzles, which involve finding keys and or items to get out of an area. You experience a cutscene here and there, and then you finally fight the boss that may or may not become the vein of your existence. And originally, this section was going to be me just, you know, dragging the fuck at a day four and day five. But after going through EX mode for the first time, uh, those two days do not compare to the hell that I had to go through during that shit. After being in the game once, you unlock EX mode. This is sort of like a new game plus, and playing it unlocks a new area known as the Chrysler Building, but then it hosts the quote unquote true ending of the game. And this right here, this big sprawling ass dungeon, is what led to this video taking a bit to come out. Originally, I didn't want to go through this entire dungeon knowing that the true final boss was a bitch to deal with, but the more I contemplated it, the more and more I became hell-bent on experiencing this ending and the fight associated with it. God, I fucking hate myself. So what exactly is the Chrysler Building? The Chrysler Building is an optional dungeon that's made up of 77 floors, with every 10 floors having a boss to face. In between them are randomly generated floors that all have an elevator and a storage room that is filled with some pretty good items. Now sometimes it'll also have mimics, which looks just like the type of shit that would be served at a typical high school. But unlike most of the areas you've gone through in the game, there is no save point at all. You can't use the elevators until you kill the boss on those 10 floors. Now, nothing is stopping you from going through this dungeon, especially with the fact that it's available as early as the second day. But the thing about that is that when you start EX mode, you're back to level 1 with all your stats having been reset. Oh, and add the fact that for every 10 floors you go through, the enemies become more and more powerful to the point where they're even stronger than the enemies you face in the museum. 
And considering the equipment you might have after being the base game, <laughs> yeah, you're fucked. To even be able to survive comfortably in this dungeon, you're gonna have to play through this game a couple of times. It'll be boring, I know, but trust me when I say that doing this will make things so much easier. In EX mode, after completing a day, you'll get extra bonus points which is needed to make your equipment stronger. And while I mentioned before that you could use these points for your 18 meter, it's damn near useless for this mode as you want to make sure that you have the most powerful equipment possible. Luckily, the grind for doing that isn't too monotonous as throughout the game you can also acquire items that will increase the stats for your equipment. And compared to the base game where it didn't really matter if you use it or not, in EX mode it makes a big difference. Now there is another thing you can do, but it's a lot more time consuming, but I'll still mention it just in case you know. As you play through the game, you might have had this junk item in your inventory. Now they might seem worthless at first, but they are your ticket to getting some of the best guns in the game. Though this does come at the cost of you having to find 300 of these bitches to give to Wayne with zero indicators on how much you have left to give. And unless you're willing to grind for over 300 pieces of junk and waste hours of your precious life, I suggest you just upgrade the inmate Dows in a bit as they'll do you just fine. And this is coming from someone who gathered the 300 pieces of junk for the most powerful pistol in the game. It fucking sucked. While the gun is great, you shouldn't have to spend an ungodly amount of time collecting these shits. And whoever thought it was a good idea to include this can eat a four ton bag of micro penises. Other than that, I ended up doing four playthroughs, which is kind of overboard, but after going through the dungeon, I'm glad I went through it. Even if I did go insane a bit. So with that said, how was it going through the Chrysler building? Three weeks later. Fuck! The Chrysler building is the worst dungeon I've come across since the first Megami Tensei. If you don't have a clue what I'm talking about, to make a long story short, those dungeons were literal monotonous hell holes that could send a man into a psych ward. The problem with the Chrysler building is that monotony that you're gonna have to deal with for every floor of this area. Not only does everything look the same, but you're also doing the same shit for each set of floors. You're looking for the storage rooms and the stairs to the next floor, all the while dealing with enemies that are stronger than before and going through multiple dead ends that made me wanna slam my head into the wall repeatedly. Oh, but here's the thing, right? What's worse about all all of this is that there is no music, none at all, unless you're in battle. So the whole time you're going through this dungeon, you hear nothing but silence in your own footsteps. Oh, sorry, there is one more thing that makes things equally worse. The floors are massive as hell. And considering that all the floors besides the boss floors are randomly generated, you damn near are guaranteed to be lost. And to be honest with you, if I were forced to give information, you don't even need to do the whole extreme interrogation tactics. If you maybe played through the Chrysler building with no emulators, nothing at all besides playing it on actual hardware, I'll give you that fucking information look at these split. Then there's the bosses, who surprisingly weren't that annoying to deal with. Now, granted, my equipment was really strong at this point, so it was damn near a cakewalk to go through. And despite it being mostly easy, there were only about two bosses that actually gave me a hard time. The first one was a crab that was on a mixture of crack and steroids, and then you had this giant ass queen bee, who actually scared me just a tiny bit. Okay. And there's one more thing too, a little issue I have. Uh, This queen bee looks more like a cockroach from Florida than an actual bee. If you know, you know. But nothing, and I mean nothing, compares to the hell that is the ultimate boss in this game, who really amps up the tension by making us walk up seven flights of stairs. As to why we have to do this is beyond me. But once we reach the top floor and have our little cutscene, it's time to fight the hardest boss in this entire game, Purebred Eve. Why the hell she called that? Fight back, Fight back, Fight back. Fight back. That's why. Out of all the bosses in this game, this boss was equally fun and extremely stressful to go through. I somehow managed to beat her in my first try, but I wouldn't have been surprised if I had to redo it a couple times of how hard she is. Before we even talk about how the fight works, let me at least just get this out the way. Make sure throughout your entire playthrough of this EX mode to save your medicine fours your revise, full cures, full restores, basically any health item that can help you out. Because if you don't, you are going to die a lot. 
Similar to the UV fight, there's three phases that you're going to have to deal with, but instead of simply just dodging and attacking, you also need to be aware when it's the right time to attack, because if you just go gung-ho and attack at Eve, she might end up summoning Maya, which will lead to her getting healed, and for how much health she has, which is apparently over 40,000, you're going to want to end this fight as quickly and as carefully as possible. As for the attacks pre-bred Eve can do, it only really boils down to two. Her first attack is similar to Aya's Liberate, but for the first stage, she'll only hit you once. But as you start drilling her health down, she begins to add a second and later third hit that progressively gets stronger. And if you aren't at a decent level or have any good armor, those hits are going to start feeling like she's dropping nuclear bombs on you. But it gets worse that starting with her second phase, she'll have a power charge move that can't be avoided and will most likely kill you. Though if you survive, which hopefully you should if you get like auto medicine, she'll be dizzy long enough for you to get some hits off. And mind you, this is where you're going to have to deal with for three phases. The first two aren't too bad, but that third becomes an all out assault to the point in which if you don't have any medicines, revives or full cures left during that point, then you're going to have to start fighting for your life as her attacks start to deal massive damage. It's imperative, extremely important that you try to avoid her attacks as much as possible. And I'm going to be honest with y'all, if there were any moment during that battle that I thought I was going to die, it, it would have been right here. Luckily by this point, I modified my armor to the point where my PE meter fills up so fast after use, and of course, I end up using the good old fucking Liberate. Now for the latter, I do recommend using it after Eve uses that charge attack, so of course you also have time to heal up and maybe get a few extra hits off. And by the time I did all of that, I was finally able to take her ass down and enjoy the credits. Honestly, I enjoyed this fight more than the UB fight, where that fight was annoying as hell, at least with the purebred Eve fight, that actually felt like a true final boss. But with that said, should you play EX mode? Fuck no. As much as I enjoyed the fight with purebred Eve, it was not worth going through all the monotonous shit of that building. I would rather play a Bubsy game while being waterboarded than to ever play through the EX mode again. Okay, sorry. That's a little bit extreme, but the point still stands, fuck this dungeon. Parasite Eve is one of those games that I can't help but always go back to, even with its issues. The game has a lot of charm, from the fusion of survival horror and RPG elements to the premise of the game being absolute bonkers. And if I were to ever be asked if I would continue to play this game into the unforeseen future, yes, it's not the EX mode. Now, I mentioned this earlier in the video, but after the release of this game, we will end up getting two sequels. The first was Parasite Eve 2, which based off the gameplay footage and screenshots, reminds me a lot of Dino Crisis 2. And several years after that game, we will get Third Birthday, which is the black streak of the franchise. Yet, I'm holding on hope that this game isn't as bad as everyone says it is. Plus, how could you hate on this game? It looks, oh, it looks so cool. Well, regardless, let me know in the comments if you guys want to, you know, see me cover the other two Parasite Eve games. Hell, maybe I can add them to a little uh, non-Final Fantasy uh, review sets and shit, possibly, maybe. Ah, eh, fuck it, we'll cross that road when we get there. So, should you play Parasite Eve? Hell yes, like enough said right there. If you do want to buy a copy for yourself, you're in luck because at the time of me writing the script and I think also recording this video, the prices for that game is going down ever so slowly. But if you're like me and you don't really like shopping at eBay and you'd rather go to your local game store, uh, just be mindful of how much they're asking for so you're not going around spending like $100 on this game, even though on price charting and through eBay, people are asking for like, what, 60, maybe 70 at most. And with that, thank you guys so much for watching till the end of the video. So I want to thank you guys not just for your patience for this video because Lord knows this shit took a while to make. Uh, I also want to thank you guys so much for a great 2023. I do know that like the year was pretty slow for the most part in terms of content. I was dealing with a lot of stuff. And uh, honestly, I think for everyone, we can all say that 2023 literally sucked. But... With this year, I am going full speed ahead. I am actually extremely motivated right now because we are close to 500 subs. Yeah, 500 more, and eventually we'll be at a thousand. And 
fucking oh god this is this is way too much to take about right now <laughs> again i want to thank you guys so much for rocking with me throughout 2023 and i hope you continue to do so in 2024 because we're going full speed ahead not only do we have our next major retrospect going on but we also have our next video which is going to be for monster tensei 1 and monster tensei 2. this is going to be a sort of dual review video and if you're wondering why you're just gonna have to wait until then. Like always, make sure to like, comment, subscribe if you guys enjoyed the video. Hit the bell notification so you guys know when the next video is gonna be coming out. And make sure to stay safe. Wear a mask because it's getting really crazy out there. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace!